This is the editing room of a scholar, a professor of philosophy. His name is Houston Smith. For six months, Dr. Smith has been doing research on a special project and recording his findings on film. His purpose has been more than usually serious and profound. He's made an attempt to discover America's own moral answers to 16 of the most basic public and private issues that Americans face. In his search, Dr. Smith has traveled thousands of miles and asked literally hundreds of questions. He's talked with scholars and statesmen, newspaper editors and economists, philosophers and politicians. Tonight, from these priceless film records of that journey, Dr. Smith has drawn together what he believes are America's best answers to another basic problem of our future. Tonight on The Search for America. I'm Houston Smith. The object of tonight's search is the American mind. The question, what can we do to improve the level of our mental health? Mental health is not a subject that can be consigned to interminable debates in the local legislature over the local asylum. It's a problem for all of us. For what is mental health? Freud defined it as the capacity to love and to work. And how many of us do these things to the full? When we put it this way, we see that mental health is never more than a matter of degree. To some extent, bitterness, frustration, and inner conflict dissipate the powers of all of us. Like every American who had read the newspapers, I was aware of the high incidence of mental illness in our society. But I wanted to begin my search by getting a clearer picture of the facts. I had been told that Professor Redlick, chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University, could help me on this point as much as anyone. So I drove to his home in Hamden, Connecticut, a suburb of New Haven. It was a pleasant early spring morning, but I'm afraid I didn't appreciate that fact as much as I might have. My mind was on my questions. Dr. Redlick, let me begin with a couple of questions concerning statistics in this area of mental health. Do you know about how many or what proportion of our population will receive some kind of psychotherapy during their lifetime? Well, psychotherapy and other psychiatric treatment uh, together uh, probably will be received by one out of seven or eight persons in the population. One out of every yes. seven or eight? eight yes, over uh, a lifetime. Uh, 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 if you think of, for instance, who is in treatment at a given time, and if you take some of the data which we collected in New Haven, there is uh, about one out of uh, about one out of a hundred is currently is, is currently in treatment. Yes. yes, I've heard that it is said that over half of our hospital beds now are occupied by mental patients. Is this roughly true? This is this is correct. Yes. Uh, uh, probably even more. Even of course, more. this does not account for the many people who ought to be in hospital beds or in hospitals and who are not. Is it possible to say why some people can stand a greater degree, say, of frustration or insecurity without snapping? Mm. We can say some general things about that. I would say that uh, uh, probably constitutional elements play a role, that some people just can take more than others. Uh, however, we don't know really what constitution is. This only future research will establish this more clearly. But we do know that people who had a very secure upbringing, 
who got love, support, security from their infancy on, and who were gradually trained to master what they were equipped to master, are people who are much apt to resist difficulties. There is one thing which I should mention, that uh, a stable environment is an important uh, contributing factor to mental health. Uh, of course, very much of our present social and political environment is everything but stable. This is something which we cannot correct, but I think this is probably related uh, to the feeling of uneasiness and upheaval and confusion uh, which many of us feel. Do we know what our rates of cure are in various kinds of mental illness? Unfortunately not, no. Our figures on this uh, are very rudimentary. Uh, I've been clamoring for quite a while and many of my colleagues who are interested in research is to get better figures of uh, what the percentage of cures are. Before these figures come in, are there some things that we could quite definitely say our nation might do in order to increase the recovery rate among the mentally ill? At the moment, the simplest answer to this is actually uh, to do more research in the field. If uh, the population will recognize the value of this early beginning knowledge, and will then enable the researchers in the field to do more and train new researchers, I think a great step will be taken. What about uh, personnel, quantity? Yeah, we, we don't have... Uh, one thing is sure, that we don't have enough psychiatrists and other mental health workers like psychologists, clinical psychologists, and social workers, and psychiatric nurses, and attendants. We need more personnel in this field, and we need also people in other professions who master some of these techniques to a certain degree, like, for instance, physicians, who have to do a lot of psychotherapy, even if they don't call it that, of ministers, of lawyers, of educators. These were important facts, but what did they mean? I wanted someone to interpret them, someone who would be willing to go out on a limb, if necessary, to tell me what he thought lie behind them and what they point to. My mind turned to Eric Frome. I knew that he was now making his home in Mexico, but that he spent several months each spring in New York City. So I drove back to New York, found him there, and arranged to meet him at my hotel. When he found out that I had just returned from a stint of Zen training in Japan, it looked for a while as though he was going to be asking all the questions, for I found him a serious student of the subject. But when I did get him on to mental health, I found him on fire with it. Dr. Frome, one hears some very alarming statistics about the incident of mental illness in our society. Do you think that these statistics are reliable enough to enable us to say that mental health is definitely on the rise? I don't think it matters too much whether what the comparison is. It's uh, difficult to establish the facts for the past, but it uh, is not so difficult to establish the facts for the present. And I think we are just in a bad way. Uh, that is to say, if we continue with uh, our kind of mental health for a few generations more, then I think we are uh, at a point where psychologically any productive society would break up and deteriorate. Um, in fact, I want to say one thing. It's one thing whether a person has symptoms and is aware of not being well, and it's quite another thing whether a person has very little of a psychic well-being but is not aware of it because he is able to kid himself by all sorts of avenues of escape. And I believe that a great number of so-called normal people, objectively speaking, are more sick than a number of people who consider themselves neurotic because they are aware of their symptoms. How, in fact, can this be, Dr. Frome, that a person can be sick and yet feel no effects, have no symptoms of this sickness? For a very simple reason. In the first place, because everybody else is just as sick, and like in Wells' uh, short story of the land of the, land of the blind, uh, people consider normal that which everybody else 
shares with them. But specifically, our culture offers a great number of avenues of escape. So uh, if people would uh, stay alone by themselves for three days without radio and drinking and cigarettes or anything else, we would have hundreds of thousands of nervous breakdowns. But we offer to our population, under the name of fun and pleasure and leisure time consumption and whatnot, we offer such an amount of escape escapes of uh, avenues of escape that people most people forget themselves in fact i would say they forget that they are human in a deeper sense because they are engaged in all these escape activities and then at the end of the day they are sufficiently tired to fall asleep and in a way they are glad the day is over and then they battle with the next day again after work is over trying to escape the embarrassment of having free time. But our culture gives them enough occasion, even for little money, to kill the time they are so eager to save. We're talking here about uh, mental illness, mental health. Let me come right to the point. What do you mean by mental health? Well, what I mean by mental health, I'm afraid, is different from what many other psychiatrists or psychologists mean by mental health. I don't mean to be unfair, and I certainly uh, don't mean that this is the opinion of uh, all other psychiatrists. I hope there are many who don't share this opinion. But certainly the opinion of many is that mental health is actually the same as adjustment the same as not being sicker than the average guy, the same as being reduced to the socially uh, current level of unhappiness, not to be, uh, not to stick out from the picture of the general run of people. Now, there is another aspect to it. Many people today define mental health actually by the absence of sickness. Sickness, uh, again, defined very often in terms of adjustment, lack of adjustment, or at least in terms of concrete symptoms like insomnia, alcoholism, this, that, and the other. I would define mental health not in terms of absence of sickness, but in a positive sense of wellness, of well-being. What does this well-being embrace? It's a very funny thing. What well-being is, is very elusive. But you see it when you see it. In fact, you don't have a chance to see it very often. Because the people who really show a state of well-being are rare today. I would say you see it, first of all, by the vitality and energy in another person, but not energy of an obsessional kind. Uh, by the energy in a person who can be alone with himself, who can be alone with another person without trying to run away. You can see it in the joy of a person, but at the same time in his capacity to be sad when there is a reason to be sad. You can see it in his unending interest and responds to people and to things. You can see it in the clarity of his awareness of other people and of situation. Uh, you might even eventually measure it in the, mus in the tonus of their muscles. You might eventually even measure it physiologically. And maybe a physiologist would have already measured it if they were more interested in well-being rather than in the absence of sickness. Can one measure it? In terms of a subjective feeling, is this what, does it involve this essentially? No, I think like with any other opinions about oneself, most of what people think about their well-being is delusion. There are many people today feel well because they take tranquilizers, or benzodrine, or this, or that, or a drink, uh, or they have to have fun, or they have to act in some obsessional way. Uh, what the statement people make about their own state of well-being or happiness are utterly unreliable. If this subjective feeling is a poor criterion and illusory and deceptive one, can you give us a positive and accurate criterion? What does it involve? 
I would say the intensity and clarity of awareness and response to the world. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The lack of egocentricity and at the same time the intensity of energy and vitality. It uh, leads towards a kind of realism then, does it, with regard to the yes. perception of things? Yes, indeed. Uh, I would say one could define well-being also from one angle as a capacity for realism, of experiencing the world and oneself as it is and responding to it. Let's follow up this lead for a moment. Do you think that uh, American society is a realistic society? Indeed, I don't think that at all. I think uh, we are probably one of the most unrealistic societies which have ever lived under the sun. Now, in what respects? Well, uh, we kid ourselves about love. We kid ourselves about our aims. We kid ourselves about our individuality when actually we are conforming all the time. But I could give, uh, and I want to give, a much more decisive and important example. And that is our attitude toward the threat of the self-destruction of the whole world. We sit here, we know that there is a good chance that not only this country, but the whole, our whole civilization, all we stand for, our children and grandchildren will be destroyed, completely destroyed by an atomic war. And we yet we talk glibly about it. We have signs for shelter in cities, in which we know there will be no shelter if a hydrogen bomb falls on them. Uh, we uh, talk about all sorts of measures. We talk about victorious war. We talk glibly about if war comes then, without an awareness, except merely intellectually, that if war comes, this is the end of all of us. And for a whole society, and this is not only America, this is practically the whole world, if you would find one person in uh, New York City or any other big city who plays around with a bomb which could kill only thousands of people and uh, there's a 50-50 chance that it might go off and he would say, well, I'm just trying it out and, uh, well, if the people get killed, it's just too bad, I would regret it, but it might be necessary. You know very well where this man would land while Practically, our whole population behaves in the same manner. Everybody knows the possibility of the suicide of the human race, and only very few people are truly aware of it. If that is not lack of realism, I don't know what it is. You have spoken of this lack of realism as one thing in our society working against mental health. Are there other things? Yes, uh, Mr. Smith, I would say practically everything. Our culture is concerned primarily with production and consumption of things. That is what counts, and the selling of things, which is the intermediary between the two acts. And in this process of being primarily concerned with things, the ever-increasing production, the ever-increasing consumption, we ourselves transform ourselves into things without knowing it. We lose our individuality in spite of the fact that we talk a lot about it. We follow leaders who don't lead. We believe that we are acting on our own impulses and convictions and opinions when actually we are manipulated by a whole industry, by slogans, and yet nobody has any true aim. We are alienated from ourselves. We don't feel much, certainly we don't feel intensely. All we are after is not to be different, and we are frightened to death to be just two feet away from the herd. And yet we are deceiving ourselves about this reality by talking all the time in terms of our traditional heritage of the Judeo-Christian tradition of humanistic philosophy, of individuality, and what not. What is the role of the mental health movement and psychiatry in this situation? Are they helping? Well, I would hope they did.
but I'm not so convinced. I'm sure some help and some want to help. But I'm afraid there is a great danger also in the mental health movement today as there is in psychiatry, psychoanalysis, and psycho psychology. I'm afraid the role of the mental health movement and the role of psychology and psychiatry are to help to adjust man somewhat more, to make him function more smoothly. You might say psychology and mental health today is in danger, and psychologists are in danger to become the priests of industrial system. That is to say, to help people adjust to a system where they are supposed to produce and consume in masses, in groups, directed by central organization and slogans, and yet at the same time not to be aware. They are dissatisfied with that. They suffer from it. They suffer from what the French already called in the 18th century la, la maladie du siècle, the illness of the century, from boredom, from the meaninglessness of life. Now, there is a danger in that, that they might get sick, that they might have manifest symptoms, that they might protest, that they might want to make life more meaningful. And then many psychologists come and say, you shouldn't be dissatisfied. If you are dissatisfied, that means you're neurotic. And we'll adjust you so that you accept a meaningless life without rebelling against it, without symptoms, and you will have a nice funeral anyway. Usually, Dr. Fromm, we reserve the word insane for individuals. Do you think it's possible that some societies might be insane? But if we mean by in-sane, insane, a lack of sanity, then indeed I think whole societies can be insane and many societies have been insane. And I'm afraid we are on the way to it too unless some drastic changes occur. But I have to uh, add uh, one remark here. There are two concepts of sanity. A society can be sane in the sense that people adjust themselves to it and to its norms. But it can be insane in the universal sense of what is good for man as he exists. In fact, all the great norms, whether you take the Ten Commandments, or the teachings of Buddha, or the teachings of Christ, are norms of human sanity, which refer to human existence, to mankind, and they are all based on the idea also that the loyalty to man and the values in men are higher than the loyalties to any given societies and the values represented by it. Dr. Fromm, is it possible for a man to remain sane in today's world? Yes, indeed, I think it is. And uh, certainly men like Dr. Schweitzer are a wonderful example that it is possible. Now, most of us are not Schweitzers. In fact, this is very rare to be, have the genius of a man like Schweitzer. But I think it is possible if one tries, in the first place, to see that certain disappointments, certain, a certain sense of isolation is a necessary consequence of remaining sane in a world in which there is so little sanity. And secondly, if one overcomes the sense of isolation by a deep sense of solidarity and oneness with all those men who have lived on the earth and who have been sane, Dr. Schweitzer would be one of them, but many of the great philosophers and religious leaders and great spiritual leaders of the human race, whether that's Socrates or Buddha or any other, have been sane. And there are even a few people today, quite a few, who are sane and who at least are willing to be sane. What matters is to have the courage to see reality, to speak out, and to feel identified with that part of humanity, whether it's today or in the past, who had one outstanding quality, that of being realist in the sense I have been talking about, of seeing the truth and at the same time of not despairing. What 
Dr. Fromm, do you see as the prospects for the future? I see only one terrific danger, and that is that of a war in which we, the, which would end with the extinction of the human race of civilization, or at best, if one could call it that way, with universal fascism, whoever wins. And for me, therefore, the question of avoidance of war is the one overriding ethical question which men are confronted with today. If we avoid it, I am very hopeful about the future because I think man has developed to a degree of rationality and of knowledge and of insight which if he overcomes his one-sided concentration on production of things will then lead him to a culture with a depth of satisfaction which we have never had on earth. I don't know what I can add to this. For those whose minds are critically ill, of course, there are many things that we can do. My wife, who has worked in this area, has been struck by seeing better mental hospitals in countries that were poorer. We are, of course, desperately short of trained personnel, and Dr. Redlick has emphasized our need for more research into causes and cures. But when it comes to the rest of us, we who manage to get through the days but have access to only a fraction of our potential, what can be said? And what about an entire society which in so many respects seems to be below par in its capacity for sane response? In these cases, I suppose, the problem ultimately comes down to one of values. There are some things which if pursued in the right way, lead to fulfillment. Others that lead to tangles and trouble. What are these valid values? Certainly truth or realism, as Dr. Frohm has spoken of it this evening, is one. And I think I caught another one too. The men, men were made to love people and use things. And when we turn this around, using people and loving things, then everything goes wrong. This is an oversimplification, I know, but it remains for each of us to work out the details. This is National Educational Television.